Welcome back to another episode of the Huxley Morton podcast, the show where each week we speak to pharma company owners and industry leaders sharing their stories of personal and professional growth. Uh, on the show today, I'm with my regular co-host, Mr. Adam Walker, and I'm also joined by Kyle McAllister, VP of Data and Analytics, uh, and CJ Anderson, CEO at CCT Research. Gents, welcome very well, much to the show. Good to be here. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. You are very welcome. Well, look, I, I know we had a, a small chat um, kind of off air there. I know that uh, I've touched base with Kyle previously. Um, but look, guys, if you can perhaps give us a quick overview of yeah, each of you, who you are and, and what CCT Research is all about. Absolutely. Well, I'll, uh, I'll kick it off here and then I'll turn it over to you, Kyle, for kind of your background. But um, you know, I, I started CCT back in 2017 with two other founders, um, but I, I usually don't share this story too often, but I think it's important for the foundation of why CCT started. Um, so while the company was created in 2017, my first exposure with clinical trials was actually back in 2002, uh, when my own father was actually diagnosed with stage four multiple myeloma and given months to live. So you can imagine the, the fear and anxiety that my family had when we received this news. And we were kind of looking around just for any type of hope, any type of option. And his oncologist actually recommended that he could participate in the clinical trial. And mm -hmm. so he actually ended up enrolling in this study. And because of the study, it actually extended his life three years. And so at the time, they thought it was only going to be a matter of months. Um, but the study ended up allowing him to spend more time with myself and his family for three additional years. And I think that's when I really kind of realized the impact and the hope that research offers to so many different patients and their families. You know, at any given point right now, there's, there's hundreds of thousands or potentially millions of patients that could receive hope in a clinical trial. So now let's fast forward from 2002 to 2017, you know, CCT was built on a very similar foundation of figuring out a more efficient way to reach patients and to allow them to participate in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And so when we started, we were actually hyper-focused on Alzheimer's disease. And so we didn't want to just have a typical model where a patient had to travel, you know, an hour and a half to a hospital or an hour to their clinic. We wanted to actually embed our research into senior living communities and memory care facilities to accelerate that process and allow patients to participate where they just had to walk down the hall to see our coordinator or PI versus traveling to, you know, let's say a hospital or the nearest clinic. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where we started the business. And then over the years, it, it, it transformed from just a neurology focused company to now we have 21 research sites across six states. And we do everything from neurology to dermatology to gen med. And then of course we did um, several of the big COVID vaccine projects as well. And so now we're at this really interesting intersection where I don't think the demand for physicians and patients to participate in research has ever been higher than right now. And what's exciting about what we do as a company is there's a lot of physicians that want to participate in research, but they very quickly realize all these administrative headaches that go along with running the study. And so there's the regulatory compliance, there's the budget and contract, there's staffing the clinic, there's buying the equipment. There's all these aspects. And so oftentimes these physicians get very discouraged because they want to offer research to their patients as a care option, but they don't want to deal with all those headaches that go along with it. Mm -hmm. And so CCT is, we're very fortunate that we offer a turnkey solution to all these physicians and clinics that want to participate in research. And so while we have 21 research sites right now, I truly believe we're, we're just getting started. Wow. And look, I guess um, we'll dig into that in a bit more um, shortly, CJ. But, um, you know, prior to kind of CCT, um, you mentioned that that started in 2017. But what was your background, say, before that? Because I know that I will jump onto Carl's background shortly, but it, it wasn't necessarily in this space, if I'm correct. So what was, what was your background prior to, to getting into research? Uh, clearly, we know why you did it, and that was kind of very close to home. Um, but yeah, what, what was the background prior to that? Yeah, so I actually moved down from Omaha, Nebraska um, to Arizona in 2013, 
to get involved in the, the recruiting space. It was more mm-hmm. for headhunting, recruiting, you know, executives. And it's similar to your background, James, where it, it started off with kind of all under the healthcare umbrella, but then over the, the first couple of years, it ended up transitioning more to a focus on clinical research professionals. So we were staffing coordinators, PIs, management, you name it. And that's really when I got my first exposure to understanding more the business side of research and what goes into creating a successful practice. And so I spent um, basically from 2013 to 2017, really hyper-focused on helping um, CROs and pharmaceutical companies and site networks like myself, hiring those difficult to find um, coordinators and investigators. Mm -hmm. Well, I know all about that. And um, there's some pivot that is. And um, look, Kyle, I know that your background wasn't necessarily particularly in this space either. So if you can give us um, and the audience a quick overview of of your background and and how you ended up partnering with CJ and, and CCT as well. Yeah, yeah. So CJ aligns with you and I probably kind of align with Adam in terms of background, but my background is more in the technology space. So I started my career working for large electronic health records companies based out of the US. So I worked for Epic and for Cerner um, and then have been kind of consulting in that space, working with large hospital systems. So very focused on sort of the you know healthcare provider side of the world and how to better use technology and data to support what they do. Um, and really, lo- really loved it, really enjoyed it. I've always loved being in the healthcare space, but I've known CJ and the, the founding team for CCT actually for a number of years um, where we've just kind of been kicking back and forth ideas for how we could make things better from a data and technology perspective for them. And then it just made sense about a year ago to, to hop over and, and get into the clinical research world, which um, if you're anything like me, James, drinking from the fire hose for sure for the last <laughs> for the last year or so in clinical research, but um, but really enjoying it, really loving it. Um, love the opportunity to, like CJ said, be working on something where you feel like you're, you know, providing some level of hope to to people that need need new therapies. So, and it must be great for I guess both of you kind of working with like minded individuals. So if you two were connected previously, kind of you've got that. Bit, I guess, CJ, from your recruitment background, you know that actually the key to business is, is in the people and connecting uh, them. And if you've got a strong team, you're going to have a strong business. Um, so I'm guessing that that has perhaps helped um, you folks along the way, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think the foundational knowledge that I had in recruiting translated directly over into what we do now because it all came down to finding the best people, right? I mean, your, your company is only as successful as the people that are kind of running the business. And one thing I really pride myself on and our team on is since day one, uh, I think we've hired the best. And so even when we reach out to Kyle, you know, we had this kind of interesting kind of question that got brought up, which is, you know, we're getting these contracts with these large clinics. Um, and sometimes these databases have over a hundred thousand patients, but our, our research staff are clinical experts, but they're not data experts. So how do we truly get the maximum value and really have the most efficient process of identifying the patients and the EMRs and then extracting that data, kind of aggregate our patient data to be able to have our team of recruiters make those calls. And so throughout the last couple of years, I I would reach out to Kyle because that was his background and really just kind of get an idea of how would you do this and kind of what's your perspective on this. And And I think it was early 2020 and then going into 2021, while he wasn't with us yet, we had this active dialogue about how could we apply data and analytics to our business to, to really make our engine better. And so I think the timing of him joining was, was really ideal because he's already been able to add so much value in not only how we select the sites, the new geographies that we go into, but really just improving that relationship with all of our databases. So. Mm. Well, I think I was perhaps ignorant to the fact of just how much the data side is just, it's, hu- it's huge and I guess Adam for you to pitch in on on, on this yeah um because I know that you've recently advised me to kind of get involved in the data and biometric space just how important would you say it is for you know CJ to, to you know bring in someone like Kyle and, and kind of have that in-house expertise because I, I know that you do a lot of advising work yourself for uh people on this so what, what would your views on that be well I mean Kyle and I sound like we're 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 coming from the same place, actually. We, we sound really like we're speaking the same language already, and I, I barely said a word. But the, the fact of the matter is, I think between the two of you, what I'm hearing is, you know, you can identify good people, CJ, and that's the key to building 
strong, highly professional, productive teams, but also from the data point of view, it's about understanding the data, but getting under the bonnet of that data, recognizing patient patterns, whether that's across geographies, therapeutic areas, because this is this is the nuts and bolts of what drives recruitment in patients and clinical trials. And right now, to be able to understand your data is pivotal, particularly if you're going to be enlisting sites, healthcare professionals, bringing in people into clinical trials. And interestingly also, CJ, you know, your backstory is very, is very aligned with my own as well, because, you know, I think unless you have a passion about the work that you're doing, it doesn't, it doesn't resonate as strongly as your story does. And, and you do something for purpose and ultimately the outcome is, is far greater and far more impactful. And, and it sounds like your purpose and the drive behind which, you know, you're building this organization is, is absolutely pivotal to that. But, but I think to your point, James, you know, data is central to everything that we do right now. In clinical trials, it's absolutely central. And it's not just because we're recruiting patients and participants into clinical trials. It's actually, if you've got a database of 50,000 people, that's gold dust. You've got to be able to identify what those patient populations look like and how you can potentially turn that into a value for another clinical trial or another site or another healthcare professional key opinion leader in a particular area. And, and that's really where the, you know, where the, the gold dust is. Wouldn't, I mean, you're both nodding. I, maybe I'll bring you in on that, Kyle, to that point. Yeah, I was just, I mean, there's so many, so many avenues we could take that conversation down, but I would just say you're, you, you, the way you put it, that it underpins really everything is, is exactly how we're thinking about it. And I think, um, it, you know, exactly how I'm approaching it um, with CCT, the, um, it, it, yeah, it affects everything, right? You know, it's, it's, a, it's what we use to drive value to the studies that we're, that we're participating in, but it's also, you know, our ability to use data more effectively is also impacts our uh, our ability to have good patient satisfaction in the studies that we that we conduct right if we're pestering a bunch of people that aren't good fits for a study that's not you know we, that's not good for anybody it's not efficient for us it's not good for the people that we're you know we're reaching out to to, to see if they're interested in the study so the better we can target patients for you know target the folks that are going to be the best potential fits that might be the most interested for a study, the better we're going to be all around um, for everybody, for all stakeholders involved. So um, that, that's one area. I mean, I think, you know, the connecting back to the, the people side of it, we are, we are very lucky. CJ and the founders have built a really strong, really experienced team of leaders um, across all of our sites. You know, I think most of our folks are our, lead, our director level folks are like 15 year plus um, research experience folks. So then having that experience to draw from, especially being kind of a newbie to research, under, but understanding data really well has really informed the way we approach the data side of things as well. So it all does connect and it's all kind of underpinned, but um, yeah, so many that ways we can take that. A lot of synergy there in terms of what you both do and the fact that you've been able to piece that together is incredible. Um, but for, for you, CJ, I guess the, the company's not been going so long, but it, you've already mentioned some pretty impressive stats in terms of the amount of sites, studies, participants, etc. cetera. Um, but before we come on onto that, what I mean, what did things look like at the beginning? Because look, you, you've explained your reasoning and your passion for, for this business. How did it look kind of day one? Because, you know, was it just yourself? Did you have a team around you at that point? What was, what was like the office environment like back then? Yeah, day one, it was me and the two other founders in a month to month office, um, really wearing every hat possible. I mean, you can mm -hmm. imagine that that first 12 months, it's, you're doing every aspect, right? And, you know, and then what happened was, we were really, really excited about the model that we had. And you know, at this time, we had no name, no reputation in the industry yet, no, no case studies. And so what we relied heavily on was the ability to show sponsors and CROs our unique model of reaching potential Alzheimer's patients. So mm -hmm. I remember we, we started to have open houses at our senior living communities. We started to give tours to sponsors about what we were doing. And the feedback was just was overwhelmingly positive. I mean, they loved it because normally the research setting is, is very clinical. And now for what we were doing, you walk into these beautiful state-of-the-art senior living communities, and it just felt very different. And yes. so we, we were fortunate that we were awarded several 
really, really exciting trials. And I still remember the first, the first couple projects that we had. And one of them was even a severe dementia trial where the MMSC score was, you know, zero to 10, where it was, it was Alzheimer's patients that when I go back to my experience in 2002, those families were experiencing that kind of uh, looking for any type of hope. And so I remember we ran this study and there were several patients where they were right in the comfort of their own home in the community. And I remember it was Christmas time, I think of 2018. And I remember we had kind of a, we were flooded with thank you letters from their family saying we were so appreciative that my family member was able to participate in this. And it was just that that reassuring moment of what we were doing is making such a, a big difference. And mm. so we went from 2018 to 2019 really focused on that. And then when you go to 2020, you know, the pandemic hits and everyone looks around and says, how, how are we going to handle this? Right. At the time, the majority of our sites were in senior living communities where we had restricted access. But one thing that I think we really had going for us is we had this network of experienced physicians, experienced staff. And so we quickly raised our hand and said, we would love to participate and, you know, bring in a COVID vaccine to market. And throughout that experience, we were fortunate that we were awarded some of the big projects. And not only did we participate, but we were the top, top enroller on several of them. And we also were audited by the FDA. And we were fortunate that we, you know, passed that with flying colors. And so 2020, I think, really put a huge stamp of kind of what we were doing, gave us great case studies, not only from the quantity standpoint, but from the quality. Um, and so then going into 2021, it was just the floodgates kind of opened up with all these other kind of high volume projects. And at that point, we were able to really kind of reinvest into our infrastructure, hire the best managers, the best department heads across the board. And now we're at the point where, you know, you know we have 21 research sites across six states. But one of the, the things that I think I'm most proud of is not just the strength of our team, but just the impact we've made on so many thousands of patients' lives over the years. And so when it started, it was, you know, just a couple patients in a senior living community. And then over the years, that number continued to, to, to rise. So is that probably one of the most rewarding things is that not just the work you're doing, but how you're making other people feel? Because I guess look, from your personal experience, you must remember how grateful you were. So I guess you know, to, to now be seeing that with other families, other individuals, how does that make you feel when you get those, those thank you letters? It, it's incredible. I mean, I'm, to me, this isn't even a job. Like when you're thinking about the career that you have and the business that you're starting, I mean, if you can have success, but you can also feel like you're truly making an impact, not just on, on patients' lives, but we're truly helping to bring the future of medications to market. And that's when I go back to, not just Alzheimer's disease, but we still have all these dermatology studies where we're seeing the impact directly for these patients and helping to bring you know, vaccines to market. And so I really can't think of a more rewarding career and industry to be in than in clinical research. And it's, I always ask so many people how they, how they got into the space because oftentimes they all have their, their different stories, but it's such a kind of hidden gem and it's, it's a large industry, but it's also small. I feel like everyone kind of has that mutual respect for what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And what's really exciting is that we really are making such an impact for, for so many people. So. Go for it, Adam. It looks like no, you've I mean, you, to you, say you, there. you touched on a couple of points there, CJ, but, but you're right. The people that serve this industry, James has described it himself. You know, the passion with which we turn up and we, we show up every single day, we do the work that we do. I've been fortunate that I did choose this career 25 years ago and I love it every day and every day now I love it even more because of the impact exactly to your point CJ but I know that this is exactly James's experience of having tried you know recruiting people into this business in this industry people come with a purpose and a passion that I don't think you find in many other industries until you've been in it and experienced it the connections that you make with people are so strong and so deep and so quick you know, within a, within a few short minutes, we have all aligned around a common purpose. And I'd love to just bring you in on that, James, because I think, you know, this is a great point that, that you make there, CJ. It's, I think it is. And look, I guess from my side of things, the amount of people that I speak to who have fallen into research, whether it's been for personal reasons or otherwise, or didn't know about it. But once you are in that sense of doing well and doing good things and the, that almost reward almost to an extent almost becomes a little bit selfish because you, you kind of you're doing so many things and getting 
you know, that gratefulness from everyone else. And it just kind of makes you feel good. That's why I like doing it. That's why I've continued to do the podcast since I got into um, the recruiting space in, in this industry. And um, look, I guess, CJ, it sounds as though you've done amazingly well with the business since kicking it off in 2017, landed some incredible um, studies. And as you said, look, was it the second top enroller for some of the, the big COVID trials? Um, so with that, perhaps is fantastic, but often brings its own challenges, uh, which are often, I guess, the good problems to have, right? You know, in terms of growth, etc. cetera. Um, and I'm gonna throw that over to, to Kyle, because I guess managing all of these different sites, studies, therapeutic areas, there's probably a lot on the data side to manage. So how has that perhaps differed to what you've done in your former life <laughs> or, you know, sectors? To, to now how have you you know made that pivot how and, and what have been the main challenges for, for yourself and, and the business on, on the data side of things because uh, as Adam says it's pivotal as well yeah yeah I'll try not to you I'll try not to open the can of worms too far and go too deep down the rabbit hole there but um <laughs> yeah I mean, in, in terms of transitioning from previous work all of my previous work was focused on population health so really how do we how do we um better engage with different populations of people from a hospital systems perspective, mm -hmm. which had very similar problems. They have, you know, it's about bringing together data from kind of community physicians rallied around a hospital setting. So it actually, when in talking with CJ, it was like, per, it was, it was uh, surprising how many, um, how much carryover there was from that world to this world in that there are a number of different systems that you got to bring all the data together in one place so that you can ask that data questions to inform, you know, what we do. So, mm -hmm. yeah, for it, very, very similar background or very similar in terms of the need, but the end goal is obviously totally different, right? You know, we're, we're talking about how do we bring together patients to, you know, participate in these trials to then serve that data to our, our end client, the sponsor that, that needs that data. And there's all kinds of challenges that come with that that make it both um, intimidating and, and potentially even daunting at moments, but also uh, really exciting and really fun to be a part of. And, and I think um, to Adam's point earlier, it's a pivotal moment in the clinical research space. I think there's a lot of attention being, being thrown this way, especially from a data and technology perspective. I think there are so many startups popping up all over the place in the data and, and technology space in this world, but um, but there there are big challenges that I think a lot of different folks are trying to take on, and um, we're really excited about you know how to figure out how to how to do them, and I think we've had some early successes in that that we're really excited about. So excited Kyle, to see where it can take us. Let me let me add to this too. When I was talking to Kyle about joining our team, I gave him a pretty tall order. I had said, you know, I want, we've, we've built up, I think, a really great network of sites. But what I want moving forward is a data-driven approach to why we select the sites that we move into, why we go into the geographies, why we select the trials, and then a more efficient way to reach those patients. And so when Kyle kind of joined, of course, there was a learning curve. But I would say after about six months or so, he was truly hitting the ground running. And now I'm, I'm proud to say, that, that checklist that I gave him, I think all of those boxes have, have been checked to oh, the point nice. where we go to Kyle and we're saying, hey, we want to move into Birmingham, Alabama or Atlanta, Georgia. Let's do a whole analysis from a data perspective or what are the, what are the top sites that could be a fit? And then once we actually go into those sites, what's exciting is I think there's so much improvement that can be made on the feasibility side of things. So if a sponsor is trying to select their locations to participate, oftentimes it may be, you know, fill out this piece of paper and how many patients do you think you can get? We've completely changed that. We come in and say, if you're looking for 100 patients, here's what we believe the top of the funnel needs to look like. Here's what we have. Here's the data behind it. Here's how many we believe we can enroll. And now we're taking on much larger percentages of these studies. And so to kind of give a quick case study, um, we have a large partner right now that's doing um, an RSV trial. And we just found out last week, you know, out of all the sites that are participating, they had the, the top five, they just, they kind of sent that out to everybody. And CCT has three of the top five enrolling sites in the US. And that's, wow. that's not by coincidence. We, before that trial started, we had all the data behind why we'd be a great partner for that, for that trial. 
and we had the final numbers, we had all the data that we needed, and now you kind of come to the end of the, the phase two portion. And again, I don't think we're surprised that we enrolled so well because we had truly a data-driven approach to why we chose that trial and how we reached out to those patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe to add to that. that Sounds sounds good. I was going to say, yeah, Carl, I'll let you uh, add to that if if you will. (laughs) Yeah, sorry, James. Um, Yeah, I was just going to say, coming into the industry, I was astounded when I found out, hitting the feasibility point that CJ just brought up, I was astounded coming in that most, most folks doing feasibilities for studies aren't doing it based on real data. It's, it's essentially, uh, you know, it, it, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to put anyone in a bad light at all, but essentially it's a finger in the wind in most instances, or at least a scientific, you know, wild guess as to, yeah. as to what the numbers are for a feasibility, how many patients have diabetes with an HbO and C greater than nine and are on metformin. It's like, Oh, probably 500 or so versus, you know, we've really um, fo- had a strong focus this year on feasibility and the recruitment side of things and really, really focusing on making them be data driven. So rather than a finger in the wind, it's we have exactly this many patients at this site. We know we can probably, you know, we know based on our enrollment, you know, numbers from the past, we can do X number of people for that study. So, um, you know, and obviously it doesn't always it. it folks do or don't want to participate, which is great. Um, but we can be a little, we can be much more direct with our sponsor partners now in what we expect to do. And then, you know, actually <laughs> get closer to what we're, you know, what we said we would. I, I just wanted to follow on from that, Carl, because as you're talking about patient recruitment feasibility and all those types of components that are so critical in patient recruitment, it sounds like you have access to information that others don't, or perhaps you have algorithms and tools that enable you to access that from whether it's electronic health records or other freely available sources, perhaps, I don't know, key opinion leaders. You don't need to tell us your secret source, but that's what I'm hearing underneath the bonnet of what maybe you're doing, because as you described, feasibility and patient recruitment, I've done an awful lot of work in early phase throughout my career, and That's exactly how it works. It's really effort on phones, on Facebook ads, on newspaper ads. These are the kind of things that drive your recruitment into patient clinical trials. But it sounds like what you're describing is a far more direct and focused approach where you know your pool and you're working that funnel to your point, CJ. And this is the language I'm hearing now a lot more about driving the data into the funnel and then knowing what's in your funnel and in what actual values of you know distinct areas that you have can i just can i just bring you back on that carl yeah and 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 you hit you hit the nail on the head and don't get it don't get us wrong we do all those other things so we have a number of different avenues that we do you know that we focus on from a recruitment perspective but this last year has really been about um focusing uh for lack of better for lack of a better term focusing kind of the calories we spend on a day-to-day basis with the people that we have on the things that are going to drive uh the most the best performance so you know those means of external recruitment are real are very important and a big part of what we do but we also have we i'm saying it more plainly we just realized that there's a lot of value in the emrs across each of our sites that we're not tapping and from the world that I came from, you know, we were starting to tap that and using that in a significant way. And coming over here, it's like, why don't we just do the same thing? Why here? wouldn't you? Exactly. Why <laughs> yeah. wouldn't you? And I, and I think, I think, CJ, you're bursting to say something, but that's exactly what I'm hearing. You know, in, in the conversation that you're both describing, it's either side of that discussion. CJ, I think you wanted to say something as yeah, well to that point. No, I, under the data umbrella, another piece that I think we've been really excited about is you know, when we go in and we're selecting sites to partner up with, we know very, we have it almost down to a science where if they have X amount of patients, X amount of exam rooms, X amount of providers, what year one, two, and three will look like in terms of the economics. And where that's transformed is when we actually put, you know, kind of a, a microscope and look down and said, okay, what are the really, really important pieces that are going to make a successful site? When we talk about access to patients, it's also made us take a step back and go, on top of just partnering up with individual clinics, what if we targeted accountable care organizations and started to contract with those groups that may have 50 or a few hundred clinics underneath that umbrella to mm-hmm. give us more access? So in the last four months, we've actually done two ACO deals that have allowed us to have access to 
specifically kind of what clinics we want to start with, but then the, the, that one clinic has access to all the patients across the ACO. And then we've also targeted kind of analytics companies to do that. So when we're discussing kind of our, our expansion plans, one thing that I've been really excited about is Kyle's kind of guidance on the access to patients and what partnerships make sense to create the most successful sites. And we've really followed that formula over the last, call it 12 months. And the sites that we're creating now are the, the potential in terms of patient reach and revenue and all of that are significantly higher than anything we've seen in the past. So we're very excited about kind of continuing that journey. Okay, it all sounds very exciting. Sounds like a bit of a success story already and probably more to come. I mean, what would you, um, in terms of how things are going, um, CJ and Kyle, um, you know, what have perhaps been the, the biggest success stories uh, along the way and, and how have things changed? How do things look now compared to what they did at the beginning, CJ? So you mentioned it was yourself and two other founders. You're running multiple hats. Um, you know, it's it can be a bit hectic. I know what that's like myself. Uh, I'm still kind of going through that process at times. Um, but yeah, how many how many staff are in the business now um, at CCT? How have things changed? How's that? How have you maintained that kind of it sounds like you've got quite a feel-good culture. How have you maintained that as you've grown? Yeah, great question. So I'll answer. So the first question right now, we have 100, about 130 full-time employees. Um, but in the last four weeks, we've hired 20 more. And we're at the point now where the, the trial volume is so strong that our, we're just trying to keep up with hiring at this point. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's really at the point where I feel like the the snowball is rolling in our direction now. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And so we're fortunate that we're there. Um, but to kind of answer this, the second question um, in terms of some of the biggest wins and things like that, you know, following kind of the, the data discussion, we went into Salt Lake City middle of 2020. And kind of when we started to follow that formula of identifying clinics that I think checked up all those boxes, we started with one group, but that one group had access to um, over 100,000 patients in Salt Lake City. And to kind of give you some perspective on how quickly we, we identified the geography and got it up and running, within the first 12 months, or call it the first 18 months, we went from no infrastructure to three sites. And I think we have over, over 20 full-time employees across, across those three locations. And we did that within a year. And that was just keeping up with the demand. And so that, that location that we started um, middle of 2020 is actually one of the top enrollers um, on this RSV study that I mentioned. And it really just, I think it was really exciting to see when we started to follow that formula and identify sites that had that potential, how quickly we got them up and running, top performers on these trials. And again, we have over 20 full-time staff members just in Salt Lake City now. And that was a brand new territory a year and a half ago. So. Wow. Sounds like you must have been quite diligent in terms of how you've gone about this. You, you've mentioned kind of following the plan, following the routine, having your USPs and sticking to them. Um, where does that perhaps come from for, for both of you? You know, is there any particular mentors that each of you have looked up to? Or has it been via networking or have you just figured it out along the way? You know, what have you learned about yourselves and, and where has, has this inspiration come from outside? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll kick that off. So I was really fortunate that when I was in the recruiting space prior to CCT, I had worked with several really, really great research companies. And because sometimes I was recruiting executive level roles and above, I had direct access into their executive team and sometimes the CEOs. And at that point, I was just a sponge. I mean, I was constantly asking, like trying to figure out, you know, how they did what they did. And it was just so exciting to me to see how these companies were growing. Um, and then when we started CCT, um, we put together an amazing board of directors that have all had really, really great kind of success stories in, in the business world and the investing side. And they started with us in 2017 as kind of our first you know, the first round of investors in our board. And what's exciting is over the last four years, they have been highly engaged. I talk to them every single week. They've mm -hmm. been very, very helpful. And all, all three of our board members um, have been great mentors to myself and our leadership team. And so I think uh, along kind of our journey, it's really important that you constantly have mentors that you're still learning from, because we have still have, the more that I learn, the more that I, I've realized I, I don't know anything. Like there's so much to learn. And so I'm really excited that the board that we have have been such strong mentors to us and they all have strengths and kind of different specialties. And mm. so we have some that are very strong on the legal side, some that are strong on the investing side and some that are strong on the technology side. 
and you kind of take those our, our board as a whole and it's really helped to frame our leadership team to have the right goals and the right focus of kind of building cct i like that kind of not afraid to ask ask questions and admit kind of your own ignorance i, I guess at times i'm often the same you know curiosity leads to you know a lot of questions and you learn a lot and that's what i really enjoy about kind of what i do and running the podcast and i guess Carl, you must have kind of similar values there to almost make that jump and kind of um, get in bed, as it may be, with, with um, CCT to start with. So, you know, who has, has has it been the advisory board for yourself or is there any external um, mentors that you've looked up to that have given you this kind of ability to, yeah, take take risk, take make that leap as it may be? Yeah, I think there's a couple, I have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, I agree, we do have a really strong board. Um, from the team that CJ and the, the founding team have developed, especially at kind of a leadership level, I think we have a really nice mix of um, like different perspectives. So, you know, CJ is, uh, is always the, why not take over the world? Like, why not take a massive jump in this direction or that direction? So, to, you know, we are, it, it can come across like we're very, we do have a lot of process and we are very process oriented, but we also have a lot of influence, you know, from CJ and other folks on the team that are, you know, like, why not take this big jump, but then have sort of that process and like scale back and really think about it type of folks that are like, well, how would we actually do that? So I think we just have an, I think the team we have now is a really nice sounding board for us to like rein in the ideas from being too crazy or, you know, challenge the ideas that aren't quite crazy enough. Um, so I'd say that. And then two, one thing that just pops into my brain as you're asking that is, you know, I've, I've, I've been across a number of different segments of the industry I worked for, you know, I worked in the payer space, et cetera. And so I've had a number of different bosses and it's funny, as you say that the bosses that I probably at the time would have said, oh my gosh, I can't stand this. This is the worst job I've ever had. This is the worst boss I've ever had because they're very demanding, et cetera. Um, those pop into my brain as the like, those are the places I learned the most. So I've had some challenge, some very demanding and challenging bosses in the past that at the time felt really intense, but looking back, you know, they really shaped how, um, how you know how I think about things uh you know and kind of demand a little bit more of myself and and, and the people around me so um I don't know time, sort of a random thought apologies but that's sort of one thing that's that's all right and, and you know what it's, it's funny you say that because Adam and I often have this conversation with other guests that we've had on the show and it's a case of that if you've got a system and you know what you're good at and you know what your strengths are you don't mind taking the occasional risk because you're prepared to bet on yourself and it sounds yeah. as though both of you are in that situation and as a, a company it seems like that's the sort of culture that you encourage you know for people to, to speak up and you know bring ideas to the table because that's where the growth comes from yeah i would if i could i'd throw one thing out that uh that i think highlights that for cct and kind of being feeling being the new guy to the team so to speak in the last year mm. um one area that i think was really impressive that highlights that is like the, the ability to take risk but sort of you know couch ourselves in the process and in, in the fact that we have a really strong team is just what CJ and the team did during COVID. You know, we were at, at the point that COVID struck, we were really embedded in uh, senior living facilities and that was the model. And obviously that got completely blown up by COVID. You can't be, we, we could literally physically couldn't be in the places that we were conducting business at that point. So had to take a major pivot, take a huge risk in jumping into a large COVID trial, which ended up being probably the best thing that ever happened to the company and really catapulted us into the growth that we're, that we're experiencing now. So I think that kind of is like a nice way to wrap a lot of what we just talked about is like, I think that, I, I think that goes back to the people that were, that were there and that they were willing to take that risk and strong enough to take that risk and really push with their skills into a new direction, but be mm. successful in that new direction. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. And speaking to the risk piece too, I mean, I go back to 2020 and when the pandemic hit in March, I had just found out in February, my wife is pregnant and I'm sitting oh. here going, this is not going to be, because everyone's looking around trying to think, you know, how, how are our companies going to handle this, right? Is it, is it a downsizing year? Is it, how, how do we just, secure as much, you know, cash on hand as possible and, and ride this out. And one, one quote that just kept coming to my mind was, 
Um, there's a saying, it's from the ex-CEO of Intel, which is um, poor companies are destroyed by crisis, good companies survive them, and great companies are actually improved by the crisis. And that kept coming to mind, which was, how do we position ourselves to actually turn this pandemic to, into a good thing for, for our company? And now when I look back, it seems like it was the obvious answer to participate in these big COVID vaccine trials. But in March and April, May, there was so much uncertainty that I remember just thinking, I'm going to have a child born in October, and I want to be in a spot where our company is, is stable and, and mm. thriving. And so I remember I went to our board and said, I think that we have a chance that we can really participate. And there was one opportunity that came up where they were looking for 1,500 patients at a single site. And so we kind of raised our hand for that. And I remember when we got the selection letter, I almost fell out of my chair because I'm like, wow, this is exactly what we wanted. But in terms of the risk taking, it was really all hands on deck to do that. And what what went really through confident. your mind at that exact moment, CJ? What went through your mind at that, that <laughs> moment when you got that letter through? What were you thinking? Were you like... <laughs> yeah, so I remember I was sitting, my, my wife was behind me on the couch and she was four or five months pregnant. And I got this letter and I'm like, I look at her and I'm like, Sam, you have to come read this. And I remember her first thought was not excitement, but just like, what have you gotten yourself into here, <laughs> CJ? Like, I, I know you wanted to do something good, but 1,500 patients. And, and I remember it, over the next few months, I had just so much confidence in, in the team and what we built that I knew it was a challenge that we could take on. And, and by the end of the study, that single site enrolled 1,460 patients. We were the number two enroller in the world. And I think it was truly such a strong case study that allowed CCT to kind of take it to the next gear and write that next chapter. But, you know, I'll never forget that moment in March and April and thinking about how are we going to handle this pandemic, but it ended up really kind of helping us, helping us grow. Love it. Adam, it looks like you've been sat there patiently trying to edge in with a question there. It, it, it's fascinating. You, you mentioned about the impact that the pandemic has had generally on, on your business, you know, from a personal point of view as well. I, I also hunkered down thinking I wasn't going to be working. I think we all pivoted. James, certainly with Huxley Morton, did the same. We all wondered what that might look like. And actually, dare I say, it, it's created enormous opportunity within this industry that we could never have anticipated. But also, I think it's it's changed that status quo, the, the very conservative, objective, risk-averse nature of the work that we do because it is so highly regulated and there are such such tight boundaries on it none of that's changed but actually what's changed is the mindset the mindset of organizations like your own like myself like James and the Huxley Morton group we've all had to pivot and change and actually say well it's it's do or die right it's basically you grow or you die and and that can be physical metaphorical it doesn't matter but we are all experiencing this from slightly different perspectives but mm. I, I think you you know the point that, that you make about also having having a child and bringing a child into the world now you know that's an incredible thing and I've got two teenage kids who've been through some incredibly challenging couple of years you know educationally my wife's a teacher you know we are all impacted by this we have family we have friends we have connections who've been directly impacted negatively by COVID um so it, it's it's almost turning it's turning a negative into a positive but it's also changing that mindset that I think I I heard you speak about CJ, which is so clear and is so transformative for this industry and everyone that's touching it. I think, yeah, you're no. spot on there, Adam. And I, I haven't seen that quote before, CJ, from the, was it the head of Intel? But I, I did read a book a while back called The Obstacle is the Way. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what springs um, to mind about turning that kind of massive obstacle of, of COVID into an opportunity. It seems like you've done it as, as a business. We've done it. You know, we were recruiting engineers. Uh, to jet off all around the world no flights meant no business um, but now kind of here I am and it's one of the best things I've ever done so look, I can hear where you're coming from from there but look I guess to move us on look it sounds like you've had an incredible journey business is absolutely booming you're winning studies left right and centre what's what's next yeah that's a, that's a great question um, something that we've been thinking about a lot over the last few months and I think we're at this point, and you know, I mentioned this earlier off on the call, is that I really do believe the demand for more physicians and patients that participate in trials has never been higher than it is now. And so while CCT has 21 sites, I think over the next 12 to 24 months, we're going to get 
really aggressive with kind of our expansion efforts while we continue to integrate technology. And ultimately, my, my goal for us is to be the best partner for drug and vaccine development in terms of having the best solution, the best sites, the best team. And so I think, honestly, with where we're at now and kind of the six states that we're currently in, I, I truly believe we're, we're just getting started. And I think there's going to be a point potentially over the next few years where sponsors can come to us and if they need a few thousand patients for a trial, we can potentially take on entire studies because we'll have such a, a large network of sites that, that can take that on. And so I think we're, we're truly building something really, really special. I think technology and analytics are going to be a big part of that. Um, and, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the, the next chapter of, of this business. Oh, it does. It sounds like it. And as, as Kyle sort of touched on earlier, you know, CJ's coming up there with the world domination, perhaps. So we will, <laughs> we will watch. We will watch this space. Uh, but look, gents, before we wrap up, look, we always close the show with a bit of a quick fire question round. And perhaps um, look, we'll perhaps open up to, to each of you or you can pitch in with a question each. We'll play it by ear. But look, I'll, I'll put the first one out there to perhaps CJ, because I've, I've, I have, this is the first time you and I have spoke. Um, but what is the, the number one piece of advice that you would perhaps give to your younger self? It's a good question. I think I would, if, if I had to go back in time, I'd probably tell my younger self not, not to worry so much. Sometimes the things that you think are bad in the moment end up becoming good. And sometimes things that are good end up becoming bad. And so while it's easy to kind of when you're in your, the current state to look back and kind of connect those dots. But in the moment, you know, not, not to worry so much and understand that there is a bigger picture and more than what we can't see. So. Mm -hmm. Don't sweat, sweat the small stuff as it may be. Mm -hmm. Yep. I like it. I like it. Kyle, should we shoot to you for the same question? Sure. Yeah, sure. I was going to say, uh, give up on the NBA now because you're not going to be six foot 10, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> that would be the best advice. No, I think it's similar to CJ as it would be, um, keep moving towards the things that you're passionate about. Keep moving towards the things that get you excited and don't worry about money and success and those things. Just keep moving towards the things that you like and the things that light you up. Um, which I have successfully followed at times and not followed at times. Um, and right now I feel like we're, we're in a pretty good spot, but yeah. Cool. I like it. Great advice. <laughs> um, so, so back to you, CJ, is, is there a, a particular book or resource that you're using at the moment that that's driving your thought around that future planning for the organization? Yeah, I actually just read a book recently called a ride of the lifetime. It's by Bob Iger. So ex CEO of Disney. And it was, really neat how he gave you a real look into his transition into becoming the CEO, the problems that he was experiencing, you know, dealing with, you know, all the employees that they had in the board and kind of navigating all of that. And so I think that he gives some really good case studies that I relate to. And while CCT is not the size of Disney yet, maybe one day, um, I think the advice was really, really good. And, you know, definitely love that book. So. The principles, I think the principles can potentially um, multiply out, can't they? That's the point. You know, if, if you start from small acorns and, and maybe the same question to you, Kyle, if you wouldn't mind, any, any particular podcasts or anything that you're particularly listening to at the moment that you'd recommend to our audience? I mean, Huxley Morton, of course. Uh, oh, the first person that said that. <laughs> no, I actually genuinely have gotten a number of great insights from you guys, from, from your guys' podcast. So cheer, cheers to you guys on that. Um, maybe taking it in a different direction. I'm a, I love, I'm kind of a health nut and I love, you know, just learning about health and fitness. The book I read recently that's jumping out of my mind is breath. Um, it's a book just about, you know, how you breathe yeah. and how it impacts everything in your life. And it changed the way I think about breathing, which is the thing I never thought about before. So that's amazing. I was listening to a pod only this week with Jay Shetty and he was talking about breathing. He talks about it a lot in, in respect to how it applies from sporting endeavors, whether you're a swimmer, a runner, any kind of athlete, you have to focus on the breath or singers even. He talks yeah. about that, you know, coming from a very deep place. And I think it's probably of a very similar nature by the sounds of it. But uh, yeah, well, that's great. That's great to hear. Cool. Well, look, yeah. for this one, we will perhaps keep it uh, just to, to CJ. It sounds like um, it's perhaps more appropriate for yourself. Look, you've been in the recruitment game. You're now in a position where you are regularly hiring. What are the top three qualities that you value most uh, when putting together your own teams? 
I would say integrity one, um, probably hunger two. I, I think it's I think it's important where, and I don't I don't I don't want to quote Warren Buffett too much, but there's there's kind of the skills when you talk about the the integrity and kind of the passion and you know all those pieces are super important. Um, or I guess when you talk about like the hunger side and, and having that, but you need to have the integrity to offset it. So I'd probably say integrity, hunger, and empathy. I mean, I think we're in an industry now where, uh, you know, we want our team hungry to be able to grow, but we also want them to have the empathy to be able to relate to the patients and be able to build those relationships. And then of course, on the integrity front, I mean, you have to have that to, to work at CCT. That's a, it's a huge priority for us. So. Perfect. It's a, it's a great it's a great point about integrity, humility. They they all speak to the same point. It's kindness. It's working with kindness. It's acting in kindness. It's making choices through kind principles, isn't it? That's really I think what you're what you're speaking to, CJ. That's a great answer. Um, and if I can point this one to to Kyle. So, dare I ask, what's your favourite thing outside of work? Uh, if it's not MBA, it might be. <laughs> are, are you still dunking? Can you dunk? <laughs> I, I have dunked in my past. I won't comment on the current state. Um, the uh, favorite thing outside of work, I have to say, we just had a little girl. She's five months old. And then we've got a toddler as well, a little boy. So they take all non-work moments are taken up by them um, in the best way. And CJ and actually really everyone on our kind of leadership team are all fairly young parents. So um, it's been fun to share that with everybody. That's awesome. And it gives you that purpose, doesn't it? You know, it gets you your reason to get out of bed at 5 a.m. in the morning, never mind, <laughs> before you have to do your, your day job. Yeah, whether you want to or not. Yep. Yes. And look, this, this is always my favorite question because I like to look, know the people behind the business as much as kind of all of the accolades and achievements you've got. So, look, CJ, what's, uh, what's your um, go to stress release activity, fun activity with the kids? I know kids is, is takes up most or 99% of my spare time as well. But what is it for you? Yeah, I really have to echo a lot of what Kyle said. So now my daughter is like six, 16 months now. So we, we have this routine. So our, our house is on this little lake where we have a bunch of ducks and, and geese. And so basically every day when I get home, we go on a walk and it's the point where we feed the ducks every single day. Um, but when we walk around our neighborhood, the ducks know our stroller. And so they, we, we go down and it's like 30 or 40 ducks come up and we feed them every single day. And my daughter just loves it. It's like the highlight of, you know, highlight of her day. So I look forward to that, you know. Are you at the point where you recognize any particular ducks just yet? Have they, has you got <laughs> named them? That's have you so named we've them? Named, we've named a couple. There's some that have, you know, unique characteristics, whether it's the color of their feathers or just certain, certain traits. And so, mm -hmm. There's a couple that we've named and then they usually come up every time too. So it's, it's been fun. I, I really love just kind of seeing her face and how much she's learning. And, um, you know, being a, being a parent is, is, has really been an awesome experience. So. Cool. I like that. We, we were doing that with our son on the, on the way to daycare. Uh, but we've realized that depending on whether he wants to get out of the stroller, <laughs> it could be a half hour walk or an hour and a half walk and we've got to get to work so uh, we've sometimes had to sidetrack uh, but look but getting a bit more kind of deeper to, to wrap up the show here uh look you're both incredible gents it's been a pleasure having you on but look um kyle i'll, I'll shoot this one to you first what would you say is your number one golden rule for both life and business such a tough one, but I, ever since Adam said it, it's kind of been in my head, uh, just kindness, I think, um, and that, and kindness can mean so many things. It can mean, you know, the way we think about kindness being, you know, warm, fuzzy, and it can also mean being really direct when you need to be really direct, because sometimes the kindest thing is to give it to somebody straight. So, um, yeah, kindness. Cool. And CJ? Yeah, I think for me, it's probably never make a major decision in the heat of the moment. I can't tell you how many times, and I even go back to my younger self when I was in college and something happened and I immediately, I would freak out or make a call or make a decision. And the next day I'd wake up and go, why, why did I handle it that way? And so now one thing I do at CCT is no matter what news I get, you know, good or bad, but specifically if it is bad news, I'll take a second before doing anything and really think through the approach. And sometimes I'll sleep on it, wake up the next day, and go was that the right idea and then i'll and then i'll act and so that's something that i try to follow you know most of the time so cool there's like a great it. principle that i've heard recently spoken to about that which is recognizing red and blue zone cj red is that high fight flight 
situation and the blue is the flow state and recognizing when you're in blue and when you're in red sounds like that's red but knowing when it's red finding that blue state where you have that clarity of thought and actually you can make those good sound decisions based on fact not fiction and what feels like the most overwhelming issue at the time when you reflect back on it 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 never is is it absolutely yeah couldn't agree more adam Excellent. Well, look, guys, thank you so much for giving up some of your time to come on and share your journeys and, um, yeah, I guess your outside activities as well. It will certainly be interesting to follow the story to see what's next. It sounds like it's been a roller coaster over the last couple of years. So hopefully that kid continues to go up and up. But look, for any of our audience that are looking to reach out to you, whether it is I guess, patients, people wanting to work for CCT, uh, investors, people that are just interested to hear more about the business. What is the best way to get hold of, of, of each of you? Yeah, for me, I'd say definitely LinkedIn. I mean, just add me on LinkedIn, drop me a message. I, I check it um, pretty much every single day. And so add me on there. I'd love to you know, open up a conversation. So. That recruiter life has not died. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, same here, LinkedIn personally. And then to your point on patients, our website has all the studies that we're running and kind of the areas that the regions we're running is. So if you are interested, if you're listening to this out there and you are interested in participating, check out our website um, and you can get in touch, with us, in touch with us there. But Absolutely. Well, look, guys, thanks again for coming on the Huxley Port Morton podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'll let you get off to enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Best of luck to you guys. Thanks, thanks so much. much.